Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I'm very happy to be here with everyone. It is a week before Christmas. I hope everyone's having a very good holiday season. Whatever you celebrate, please make it a good one. And uh, the other thing I'll just say before I introduce my guest, who you've seen before, is if you uh, like what I do on this channel, please do subscribe to this channel, get the notifications, do all of that. I've been told I should say this at the beginning of each broadcast, so I'm doing it here. And uh, of course, you can always check out my website at richardolmembers.com if you like all of that. Okay, with that said, I'm here to introduce my guest, Alan Levine. We've uh, we've been on for two really engaging episodes for The Richard Dolan Show in the past. Alan, welcome back. Thank you. Pleasure yeah. to be back. It is good to have Merry you. Merry Christmas. Back. Merry Christmas to you. And, and Tracy. Thank you. And you as well, sir. Now, I think I think um, your last two interviews kind of blew some people away. I really believe you have, um, you provided some very powerful revelations. And just to recap, I would encourage people to check out the videos which are here on this channel. But uh, uh, the first one had to do with your, uh, I think previously, I, I don't wanna say unknown, but almost forgotten uh, experiences way back in the 1970s with the organization APRO which was during that time, certainly the leading UFO civilian organization in the world, without a question. And you, were, you weren't you were just a member of APRO, you were very well connected to the Lorenzans, Carl and James who ran it. And um, and you were you were kind of in, in a lot of inside stuff. So that was the first interview we did, it was fascinating. And then the second interview, I thought actually was even more uh, incredible, but that was just me, that was your two, uh, focus on your two UFO sightings, one of which I personally think seems like an abduction. We got into all of that. You provided some very interesting visuals for that. Um, and so all of that is available. And then during that, you uh, we, you kind of had a couple of these, these hints, tantalizing hints, teasers about what seemed like a well, let's just put it out there, an attempt by the Jimmy Carter White House, we're talking in the late 1970s, possibly to engage in some kind of UFO disclosure, if we can use that. And APRO was involved in this. You were involved in this. This, this is, you know, if, if someone's new to the UFO field, they may not realize how shocking uh, a statement this is. This is not something that I think was known or suspected by UFO researchers. I am not aware of it. Uh, I will point out to, to viewers here that we have uh, documentation and images that we will be showing to support what you are saying here. So, uh, I mean, it's really quite fascinating. Uh, basically an aborted disclosure attempt, we could say, by, if it's not the Carter White House and some source within the United States government at the time, Amazing stuff. So let's let's recap it. And I don't know if you want me to show any of these images yet. If you do, just tell me. I've got them on ready to go on screen share. But well, how why, do you want to why, just why you, ease us in here? Yeah. Let um, let me just preface for because a lot of the viewers that that you know aren't the same age as as myself wouldn't understand the what the country was like at the time. Uh, it's nothing like it is today. It you might say it was a smaller country at the time, communications wise, government wise, everything was a much smaller, much tighter. You only had three networks uh, that you could watch television on. They were free. There was no cable TV. You had PBS, but no one counted that. Uh, <laughs> That's so true. You know, every everything was local. It wasn't like uh, you'd go, you were getting the New York Times every day. If you wanted a New York Times, you had to go to a newspaper, you know, uh, place that sold magazines and stuff and buy a New York Times there. It wasn't delivered to your home. There wasn't the communications that you have today. Even mail, if you ordered something today on Amazon, you're going to get it the next day. Back then, you're talking four to eight weeks, <laughs> you're going to get something. So it was a much different time. And uh, given that atmosphere, 
communication didn't spread like it does today on the internet. Today, if there's a new uh, UFO sighting, it can be all over the world within minutes. Somebody uploads it from their camera, their cell phone, and everybody sees it within minutes. Back then, it could be weeks before something would get to you. Someone would send you information like us at APRA. We would got mail every day. Some cases you might have waited two or three days if you could even get around to opening the letter and read in, getting in touch with them and stuff. Yeah. So much, much slower. A different world. Much yeah. smaller. Yeah, completely different world. Now, go when I began with APRO, my uh, initial concept was that I would be working basically as a staff artist. It was never my intention to be an investigator, but that's how it evolved very quickly. In fact, immediately, mm -hmm. you know, Jim wanted me to go out and, hey, no, I don't want you to just take, you know, make models, I'll ask questions, blah, blah, blah. And it became like a... I was thinking of it like a police sketch artist, but it became more like an investigator collecting clues and stuff. And as this went on, we started to amass quite a bit. Uh, and just, you know, looking back on now from my <laughs> professional experience, I can see how the elements of this, it was always treated like an intelligence operation. It wasn't treated like a bunch of, you know, weekend warriors go out and talk UFOs. Wasn't You're like talking that. about APRO here, the organization APRO. was run yes, like an intelligence yes. operation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, everything, my experience with law enforcement, federal law enforcement uh, uh, during my career was everything went up and nothing kind of came back, you know. Uh, they to say, look at this or look at that. You get the information, give it to them, it went up the line and you never heard anything about it. That's the same way things would happen at APRO. Go out take a look at this, interview this person, bring back, I debrief with Jim, everything would go up line. Whatever happened to that? <laughs> you didn't know. You could ask questions. Um, and we'll, I'll, we'll talk to you about some of the questions I had when we got, got into this disclosure thing. And Jim was very good at not answering. It just, you know, you'd ask him and it was just like, did he hear me? <laughs> you know, he wouldn't mm -hmm. answer. And that's, Again, very typical of an intelligence operation. And you begin to go like, don't even ask. It's not even, it's not even important to ask. You've got a task. If you don't want to do it, you can quit. You don't have to do it. You know, you can go out and do your own thing. Can so, I can I just interject? Uh, this seems sure. quite relevant because uh, you know, in our previous conversation, you uh, indicated your very strong belief that Jim was actively involved in the U U.S. intelligence community during Absolutely. all of this, or in the military. So uh, that that connection uh, seems like it would be a at least a partially good explanation for why APRO seems to have been working with the U.S. government on this project that we're about to discuss. Is that fair yeah, to say? Yeah, yeah. APRO was the only thing operating at the time. MUFON <clears throat> was just... Uh, Nothing and the UFO uh, reporting uh, side there. MUFON was really they, new. MUFON was just kind yeah. of getting the feet wet a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah, and they were rogue from APRO. They they had been members of APRO. Um, and Jim, the friends Jim had were all intelligence users. Like Ray Fowler, the, who uh, did the Betty Andreessen, he had the exact same military uh, uh, status as Jim. He was a uh, radio intelligence electronics expert working for the Air Force under the NSA, which is the only time I've ever heard that, that the, the Air Force was had the NSA cooperating with them or had people within the Air Force working for the NSA. But mm. that's exactly the same thing that Jim did. And they were good friends and corresponded all the time. So, uh, and Ray's still around, I believe he, yes. he shared that he, yes, yeah, he is. he's still around. And it'd be interesting I, if, if you ever have a conversation with him to ask him more about Jim's background, because he might've confided in Jim, you know, what he was, you know, doing more so mm -hmm. than he would have someone like myself who was a military. Because I know he did with Wendell. Uh, Wendell, who was an Air Force Colonel, he, he, that was his best friend. They did communicate quite a bit you know uh, some of the new so anyway, people out there that's wendell stevens a longtime ufo investigator former air force pilot and officer and much more yeah 
Yeah. Um, so coming into this, and and I didn't know this till till much later. This Jimmy Carter, what we would call dis- disclosure. That uh, we didn't call it disclosure at that time. We just call it, hey, we're just going to reveal what happened. But there was another kind of slight attempt back during the the end of the Nixon administration, and that's open source. Uh, the Nixon administration wanted to get out something more exciting than the moon landing, you know, because they had all this Watergate crap going on, mm-hmm. and they wanted to change the subject. And they approached NBC, who I did some work for on their original uh, project, uh, Blue Book TV series in 79. Uh, they approached NBC and said uh, to a, a producer there, Edderman, I think his name is. And they, uh, Bob Edmanager. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Edmanager. And they, they post, hey, if we gave you the Holloman, you know, landing UFO thing, would you, could you do a movie on this and stuff? And oh god yeah i would do this and that just all fell apart but that was like a soft disclosure at that time well we we have always been told that uh there is a scene that in which the original video or the original film was used for that uh, for that film yeah and i'm wondering if yeah i'm wondering if that film that they're talking about if just because so few people have seen it if they're not conflating it with the um um uh, what's his name? The uh, astronaut uh, Cooper. Uh, 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 oh, what's his name? Uh, Gordon Cooper. Oh, Gordon Cooper. Gordon, yeah, Gordo. Yeah, mm-hmm. Gord, yeah. Uh, he he filmed that landing at a base he was at. Yeah, in the sixties. That yeah, was at Edwards. And, yeah, uh, yeah. But I'm wondering if the Holloman film and the Edwards film are actually the same oh. film. I don't know. That's because, yeah, I, I'm thinking maybe they're they're conflating it, and because no one's he said, well, I stand up line. I don't know where Randy says, how do you follow it? You know, so it might be the same film. Because how many times is the UFO going to well, land? Well, the thing that that, that film you're talking about, uh, I'm trying to remember this, but Gordon Cooper was uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. I am I getting this? It was in the early '60s, yeah. not the '50s. I think it was in the 60s. Um, I think it was 67, 66 or 67, somewhere right around there. Maybe a little earlier than that. But but he he did not see the craft. He said uh, Air Force people came to him, however, and he looked at the negative that had apparently. Yep. And, so, and then it was never seen again. He said uh, guys in black suits came. They took it. Gone. Yep. So if if that's what was shown, that would be that would be a very big deal. But I don't know how to authenticate that. No, no, there's, the, you know, uh, possibly if they do in this new congressional review, they, they want all the evidence rolled <laughs> out from back then. Oh, you know, sure. Yeah, they'll they'll definitely do that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, they go, oh, well, we don't know where it is. We don't know where the Roswell files are or anything. I, I guarantee that they're they're at uh, uh, Andrews Air Force Base there in the federal archives. They have a 20 acre um, federal archive there. Of of stuff that goes back to World War One, and I guarantee that's where it is. That's it's Andrews Air Force Base is has some UFO connections as well. But anyway, the the Nixon administration had this soft attempt, didn't go anywhere. Nixon gets uh, resigns, and then we get into Carter, and just like uh, well, when there was Ford, then Carter, mm-hmm. the Carter administration had all kinds of challenges. It's that's people who grew up during that time know <laughs> and he was fighting the press he was fighting the, the democrats he was fighting the republicans it was a mess and uh he was really beaten up badly um uh it was i was really surprised even at my age that he was even elected being a governor from a small state you know uh he did have a great military background um but he he wasn't his name wasn't on everybody's lips, you know, as far well, except as except David uh, Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski. Yeah. Working yeah, behind the yeah. scenes saying that guy. <laughs> yeah. 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 If, if you've, and, and that's how people are selected, really. I mean, that's, that's mm-hmm. how it goes. You, you've, if you've got important people that have the money that want you, that they'll make you a star. And, and that's what happened. He gets elected, things go South mm-hmm. and near the end of the administration, I, I really think, he wanted 
this to get out. Now, I've heard you've shared this story before about he was briefed and he was crying. As I've shared, I've met him several times during my professional career. We never talked about UFOs, for sure. It was just protection detail. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly don't see him as a person who would weep over this. But I can see someone, given his temperament, someone who would be very angry that it was being hidden. I well, can, he I, may, I don't know if he actually was sobbing. Uh, as it was told to me by someone who was in a, I'll just say a very good position. Yeah. To, I know this. Uh, he had his his head in his hands and his elbows on his desk. So he was like like this. And yeah. he, I don't know if he was actually sobbing. I mean, he probably wasn't sobbing, but he was, according to the witness, deeply upset. So maybe that's a better way to put it. Uh, it, it, I can see, given his personality, this is something that he likely would have, you know, probably still does, feels that shouldn't be hidden, that, you know, let the cards fall where they may, and there may mm. have been a little revenge, too. There may have been a little, mm. yeah, these jerks, I'll show them, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think a lot of times politicians feel that, hey, if I reveal this, I, I'm going to build it. I'm going to go down in history as the guy who revealed this. I think that was very much in, in Bill Clinton's mind when he came out and talked about the meteor having, you know, uh, elements of, of life in it. Uh, you know, we Man. verified this mm -hmm. uh, because it it's it's a feather in your cap. If you're the president that announces, hey, life has been found elsewhere, it can be very important. Why don't they? Uh, it's very easy to understand that it's Bottom line, it's a threat to not just this government, but all governments. Uh, we're married to the government, and it's a marriage, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that has a lot of deceit, lying. We steal from each other. <laughs> you know, there's there's all kinds of intrigue. We don't trust one another. And uh, picture this: the government, your spouse, gets a phone call. Hey. We're from another solar system. Uh, we're going to be your neighborhood. We'd like to stop in, talk to your people. We want to share some stuff. We've got these great ships. We've got medicine. We've got science. And we want to just meet your people. We want to study your culture and everything. Well, what do you think your spouse is going to say? Not on your life. <laughs> They're not going to. That's like a supermodel calling you. <laughs> They're not going to let you know. They're going to say, oh, look, you know, our people, they're very good. shy. They're very <laughs> shy. Out of they, they'd be very frightened. You know, if you're going to be here, talk to us. We'll let you know what's okay for you to do, what's not okay. And if, if you want to establish trade, yeah, but just let's keep it between us. And if you want to study them, go ahead, but keep it on the down low. Don't kill anybody. Don't hurt anything. And we'll just keep it between us. They're not going to let you know. And that's where we are today is they're fighting this back and forth because if you did know that these people are here, not only that it's been hidden from you, but that, hey, what are their governments like? What do they have to offer that these guys aren't offering us? You know, it would, it's not that it's going to disrupt churches or that it's going to disrupt the monetary system or uh, uh, how engineering uh, energy is those things will be affected oh, yeah. but we've had those effects before oh, so i think they i bet they have a totally uh, awesome mind control system that once everyone gets jacked into it they'll love to have their minds controlled by the central hive so uh, we got that to look forward to uh, well yeah I, I really and we can talk about this later <laughs> i really think they're more like our pioneers of the 19th and 18th century more than we are even ourselves today. Uh, you look at what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, explorers, historians, scientists, hmm. uh, doctors. You could take any of these people and put them in the 18th century where we were doing exploration. Uh, think of Lewis and Clark. You hmm. know, they go out, hmm. they study, the, the plant life, they study the animals, they they send information back to, you know, Washington, they're mapping things out. Uh, they're 
kind of free spirited. I don't see this hive mind kind of situation. I'm not saying it doesn't, it's not there. I just haven't seen it with, with. All right. With fair enough. Life. That's, that's gotta be another, that's another interview for us. Yeah, there's another interview, but anyway, oh. so, so, so going, going into this, uh, as I said, I thought I'd be making models, but I quickly yeah. became an investigator, investigated a number of high profile, lengthy investigations that are still talked about today, very in depth. And then, you know, I had my first experience before I even went to APRO. So there was no need to convince me. I hear all the time today that, you know, oh, we need data. We need proof. <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I was in here. I go like, I, I just, I'm following up. I want to see more now. I want to learn more now. I've seen one. There's, you don't need to convince me. Uh, let, let's find out more about this. So, so let's jump into, uh, let's jump into our 1978 experience. Can I exactly. show any of these images yet? Or do you well, want let, let's, let's, let's talk about what, what happened uh, going yeah. into 78. This is early 78, January or February of 78. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Lorenzen comes to me and says, hey, we've been contacted at APRO uh, to, to um, be the uh, go-to people for a museum that's being created in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's going to be at the IDS Center there. And I didn't know where the idea center was or anything about this. Again, remember this mindset. This is a very. You I'm going to share this image I, here, sure. just so people can see. This is page one of the brochure of the uh, this center. Yeah, the yeah, idea center. Uh, and yeah. here's a, the other part of the. Think about so it's how, a brochure, right? Yeah, right. And this is Think where about this. How impressive that building would be in 1978. That would be an impressive building today. In yeah. 1978, that was like, wow, that's where we're going to have a museum. And he said, exactly. yeah, we're going to have a museum. We want you to do all the models. Uh, we're going to have all these different cases. And I said, well, how big? I'm thinking something tiny, really, you know, like a one kind of room in that whole office. No, no, no. We're going to have the whole top floor, 15,000 square feet. Unbelievable. It's it, I've done two exhibits as I've shared. There were 6,000 square feet and they were huge. I, I was going into those. I go like, yeah, can I fill this? Mm -hmm. 15,000 square feet in 1978. I go like, is there that many cases <laughs> that we can fill this thing with? Uh, that's a huge amount. And this is prime real estate at the top of the IDS center. Uh, you couldn't get anything more expensive. And my first question to Jim was, who's paying for this? Who's, who's doing this? And it was silence. He didn't say so. Yeah, there's no it. way that APROs bring in that kind of money. No. Not a chance. No. You're talking $6 a year for membership for APRO. Not a month, a year. Plus they're, they're cranking out their uh, monthly brochure. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, that, that was included. That, that was included in the, the membership, the, the, right? And Unreal. they, at their peak, it was only 1,500 uh, uh, members. They had to be spending more postage because uh, um, at least, I think it was 25% were international members, you know, outside the United States. And back then, shipping uh, even, a, you know, a regular legal envelope somewhere, it's costs you a couple of bucks. Yeah, it's half your membership for the year to <laughs> send you the monthly uh, um, uh, newsletter. Right. So right. I knew they weren't doing it. But again, we had gotten bigger and better the entire time. We moved from their house to a, a bigger office and just a couple months later, an even bigger office um, with security apparatus and stuff, a burglar alarm and uh, digital key entry path, which was really state of the art back then. Today, you have that at your house, but back then, that's like, wow, you know, cool mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and I'm going like, where are they getting all this money? I'm thinking, ah, I, I guess Jim has spent his pension on this stuff. But I mean, even today, I, I go like, how can they afford the lease? And they had a full-time uh, administrative assistant. And it's got to be another body. source. It's, it's undoubtedly, yeah, it's, it's government. Gotta, it's got to be a government source. Yeah, ab absolutely. And um uh, so again, I'm a young kid. I don't ask questions. I'm just trying to do my thing and stuff. And 
And he says, yeah, we're going to do this. And he put together a contract, which, which I shared with you, which laid out who the models would belong to. Uh, we were supposed to get a stipend from it. We never did. Uh, um, it, you know, the APRO would retain control over the models and all the uh, information about that. And uh, uh, then they, he sent them that. They agreed uh, and they started listening. Hey, these are models we want you to do in the run up. This would be through the summer of 78, make these different models. There was going to be a large exhibit of the Betty Barney Hill. Uh, Can I show uh, some of these models? Yeah, please. Yeah, so sure. let me share. This is a really dramatic one. And I think you said you did not make this one. Is that right? I did not make this one. This is a mysterious one. And maybe someone in your audience will recognize this because the artist is unknown. This was part of the press release uh, um, that another came version. out. You know, yeah, that's another a three quarter view of it. Yeah. Uh, that came out in uh, November 11th of 78. And it quickly caught my attention because having spent a lot of time doing makeup special effects, I go like, well, this is a, a, a life cast, or in this case, with the eyes closed, a death mask. Looks and like I'm going, it. my first impression is, where was his cast? And Jim says, oh, it was sculpted. I go, sculpted? I said, that doesn't look like a sculpt to me. It looks like a, a, a life cast or a death mask. And I said, what's it made of? He says, plaster. And I said, well, then it's been cast. It had to have been cast in a mold. And I said, likely they used, back then we used a, a, a material called melage, Today we use silicone, but they used to use melage. You put it over the subject's face uh, and um, take a cast of their, their face. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't tell me who the artist was. Uh, I never saw this piece in person, but later on, I, well, I immediately suspected, if you look at the eyes, look at the lack of bio, uh, biosymmetry in the eyes. If you look at the eye on the left-hand side, yeah. You'll see it, it's 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 got like a little indentation. Uh, right. That's not something you would sculpt in. It looks if like it's you, almost slightly open. Yeah. And it? this this to me looked so lifelike with the, the corners of the mouth and the, the folds of the uh, eyelids uh, underneath the eyes and stuff. I go, this looks like this was cast on something. You uh -huh. know, of, of, it's really and, interesting. So I, I can't I can't say for sure, but this will be relevant later on when we get into the uh, um, even even this on this one. This this is a lower resolution. It looks like it was yeah. taken from a newspaper, but still you can see like you look at the mouth, the lips. There's indentations around there that are yeah, this very is, detailed in the in the lines under the eyes. I've sculpted um, hundreds of, of things. Now you got to remember back back at this time, back in the seventies, there weren't like thousands of, of of alien sculptures or anything like that. No, right. It was unknown. It was just really crude drawings. If you look at witness drawings, they're like stick figures. It looks like like a cave drawing almost. Mm -hmm. This, when I saw it, I go like, this looks like it was taken off live anatomical subject. It does, is, or a dead anatomical subject. Really well done, and, that's for sure. Really? Yeah, and, and and like I said, nobody could tell me where it came from. Never saw it in person. Don't know what happened to it. If there's someone in the audience that knows who did this or how it came to be or whatever happened to it, I'd like to know because I'd like to know that. Oh yeah, so and so sculpted this, and you know, it was a one off. Someone please, or whatever. Uh, at, if nothing else, leave it in a comment if you do know the the story of this to any of the viewers. Yeah, can we but look at it was, these other images or not? Sure, you... sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Go oh, this this is interesting. Yeah, yeah let's, this, let's explain this. <laughs> yeah, this was part of uh, of the press release uh, that was supposed to showcase what the exhibit was going to be like. And, oh, and actually, can I back up? The there's an actual image of the exhibit. This is this is yeah. one part of the gallery. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but I just want to. No, 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 not at all. So this this is all like developed for it, and then and then you got this. This is a PR. A photo you said yeah yeah because the, the when this press release went out the museum was not open at that time we didn't even have all the exhibits made we were still building stuff and so there was nothing to it was just a press release that this is going to open up they didn't give an opening date they just the press release was dated november 11th they didn't say 
open on this date, everybody come. So this had to be a staged. And who did that little alien there? I have no idea. I don't know what that's supposed to be, but this, this was a staged thing. It probably is uh, it, that earlier picture you saw with the UFOs on background. It's probably, they just spun the camera around. It's probably the opposite direction of this, likely. This that's probably, nice. those kids, that's probably this standing in the back here, you know? Yeah, the, yeah. The, turn the camera around and, and photograph that. But uh, that's, that's a setup photograph because there was no museum open at the time. Um, Did this museum so, actually ever open? I'm not sure if I. I, I, I don't know. know. You know, uh, we, in our conversations, I've gone back to to search the net to see if I can find anything about it. Did it open? How long was it open? I, I don't know. Nothing. Because maybe it never did. Like I said, I no. I, I I well, and you'll see why. I think the reason yeah. why it did uh, is be for the reasons we'll talk about in just just a few minutes here. Uh, this, this was another piece I was supposed to to do, and I did finish it. This is a, the you did make this. Sculpture. Yes, you did yeah, this, uh, this. Yeah, I, I I did this. This is two uh, different pictures of it, and I did finish it and uh, do a painted version and everything with glass eyes and stuff. Um, all these models that I did do, it's based no on this, that, based on that creature there. Yeah, uh, that was from a Scandinavian or Norwegian. Uh, citing it, the 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 witness had a very elaborate thing. But if you're going to fill a fifteen thousand square feet of museum space, you got to have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and this was one of the sightings that they wanted to do. Um, whoever was promoting that museum or who was ever on the board wanted this as part of the exhibit. So so and how, how did this happen? So did some did Jim? Lorenzen say to you, we're going to do, I'd like you to do a mock-up of this drawing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And you're going so to do it, that uh, for the display. They, yes, exactly. Uh, they had different cases, Betty Barty Hill, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Betty Andreessen. Oh, well, uh, we got some more here. So, oh, this is, uh, yeah, your, you interviewed Betty Hill for this. Yes, yes. Uh, and you created <laughs> this drawing. Yes, based on, she never liked the original drawings that were done at the time uh, right. when she was being interviewed in the 60s. And I said, well, I'll redo it for you. And so I did based uh, uh, on our interview. Those notes uh, that you showed a second ago, those are the only written notes that I took the entire time in April. I thought it was so important because I really, <laughs> even, even more than Jesse Marcel, I thought this was the premier case because there was so much physical evidence. There was evidence on the car, evidence on her clothing, uh, radar confirmation. Uh, 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 the highway patrol had seen uh, something in the sky. Mm -hmm. There was so much co collaborating information. I thought this is the premier case. If anything can, can really unravel this, this case will. So I always thought it was real important. So these and these were the sum total of your, your notes here for this. So let's just look at those, them. No yeah. hair, no eyeglasses, very little blinking. No eyelashes. Oh, eyelashes. Lashes. Sorry, yes, of course. Uh, like dog, dog's eye. Like, yeah. Like a dog's eye. Yeah. White, uh, white and pale. You, you, very you, marshmallow. You yeah. Yeah. White uh, and and pale, very marshmallowy. That's the skin, and that, as I've shared, has been confirmed by two other witnesses that did, that never knew this because I never, uh, uh, and no one APRO ever released that the similarities between the marshmallow-like uh, texture of the skin and, and these gray aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, they had five digits on the hand. Mm -hmm. uh, they wore red uh, military style uniforms with turtlenecks. Uh, ears were kind of like little bumps. Uh, no lines or wrinkles in their mm -hmm. face. Uh, no signs of age uh, between the different aliens. Um, uh, their shoes were a dirty tan and dark color, and their noses were very small. Okay. I was very interested in alien physiotypes and, and wanted to create phylums of the different descriptions. But the grays, what we call today the grays, which I contend are uh, based on my own observ physical observation, they're more like a vampiric gray, like a real, real, real pale, almost white 
not gray like a battleship gray. No, uh, right. Now you interviewed like, Betty Hill in order for this museum project as well. Though. Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was all supposed to be part of this exhibit it in was Minneapolis. Supposed to be part of the exhibit in Minneapolis. We were going to build a ship. I was going to do a fairly large, uh, like a three foot model of the ship. Uh, this is I the did, ship. Yes, that's the ship. Whoops. Now no. that's a, a combination of her description and Barney's description because they were both they were a little bit different her description didn't have that kind of curvature to the ship uh, hers is had the windows bowed out just like that with uh -huh. the lights on either side the little fins but it didn't have that kind of like stepped on kind of like a blood cell type shape to it um and, and i've shared with you this is so similar her description was so similar to the uh <coughs> the turkey the turkish uh, ship that Dr. Lear was witnessed. Was yeah, the Kumbergaz uh, from 2007, 2008, yeah. 2009. If, if looking at that picture, and I, I sent you a, a copy of that picture compared to a drawing that I did for the museum there, I got to say to me, that looks like the same ship based on this. It kind of does actually. I hadn't really thought about it, but uh, I can see where you're going with that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to build a big ball of this. Uh, I did do a little two foot uh, alien, uh, basically half scale, uh, uh, that was used in a film later. Uh, UFOs are real. But uh, this, this that, ship that we're looking at, Alan, um, were you going to do a, a model of this as well? Was that going to yes. be part of the? Yeah, it was going to be a yeah, it was going to be a three foot diameter model, uh -huh. uh, full you know, uh, and you would have cutaways so you could see the interior and stuff, you know. V mm -hmm. very engineering like you know it's a uh, lot of work oh yeah but i mean if you're uh as an artist this is very novel this is like oh this is cool stuff you know this mm, is totally. this, again when i began with apro i thought uh, because of my interest in aerospace engineering my background in uh uh machine engineering design I thought, oh, this is great. I'm not just making airplanes. I'm making spaceships. <laughs> you know? And was it was it Jim Lorenzen who basically directed you on this? So did Jim say, I want you to interview Betty and I want you to make models of all of all of her encounters? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that was yeah, that was the whole that was the whole discussion beginning in 78, right through the summer of 78, uh in, until we got the press release in uh uh November eleventh of seventy-eight, was nothing but working this up doing designs i give them to him he'd give them to who knows i don't know who and he'd go yeah they like this he would always say they he never said jimmy carter like this or the air force dod like this he just said yeah they like this yeah go with this and but he made it clear to you that this was a, a government thing somehow some part of the government well not not at that time it wasn't until after the press release in 78 at going into 79 that he said yeah this is this is more than you think it is because i okay. I, I continue to insist who's doing this because if you look at that press release and there were several pages in the press release is that the, there is was that in the beginning of our files should i go back and look at yeah, that yeah yeah you can go back to that uh, that type me, um, stuff. i'm gonna go right to the beginning it says ufo alert this one yeah yeah uh, let's share that so this is, I guess, the that front was page. That was the folder it came in. Yeah. Well, 1978. It was, a, 1978 is a really nice brochure, a big brochure. And this, it, there's several pages here that yes. talk about the exhibit, what they're going to do. Is there it. is nothing in here about who is on the board. Any museum that, that I've worked with, they have a board. There's a board of trustees. Museums are supposed to, they're profit and nonprofit museums, but they always have a board. Who's funding this? Who's sponsoring it? Who's the president? Who's the, you know, who's involved in this thing? There is nothing in here about who's doing this. Only that Project Blue Book and APRO are going to be the two sources. And they clearly, I, you know, list that in there. App, uh, Project Blue Book had been closed for 10 years. So APRA was really going to be the only source. I'm going, they're depending on us for 15,000 square feet. And I kept bugging Jim, what is this about? Who's doing this? Where's this money coming from? 
and he just <laughs> wouldn't say he he just you know he wouldn't even change the subject he just asked me well what about this project here are you working on this or can you give me some drawings on that he just ignored he you just, he just ignored, just totally in a ignored you. Way, he was uh, he's he, if if you ever watch a politician being interviewed on the news that's exactly wow. what it is. You know, so a reporter will ask a question and they just like, well, he didn't answer anything I asked. All right, so this is all before my time. Like I wasn't involved. I never knew the Lorenzes. I wish I had. But uh, I have to admit, like when I looked back in uh, from my little sources, I always looked at Coral. I never looked at Jim because Coral was the writer. Coral was, she was like much more of the face of the organization. Yes. But yeah, what well, you've been saying was... along, Jim was really, he was driving this. Yes, uh, really Coral driving. was at home. Coral was at home writing. Remember, at Hollerman, she was the public. She was the spokesperson there for the the office at Hollerman for the the, the Air Force itself. But they were working APRO. They were sending out uh, their newsletter of APRO. APRO's newsletter from Hollerman Air Force Base. You know, <laughs> and, yeah. and why that everyone's missed that for all these. I never, years. never knew that. I never knew that. Yeah. Yeah, the, I'm going like, obviously this was Air Force related. There is no way all that mail that comes, any mail that comes out of uh, an what Air Force base. What the hell is the U.S. Air Force in the 1960s, 1950s? The 1950s. What are they doing? Promote? Are they promoting APRO? Is that what they were doing? Well, the, in, 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 they joined... Uh, Right after night, they they left Wisconsin, went to L.A. for a very short time. Uh, then it's all in the started, early fifties. That part, yeah, in the fifties, fifty two, yeah. right after the wave. Now uh, Ray also begins his career in fifty two uh, with the Air Force. Uh, Ray Fowler doing the same type of work as Jim is doing, uh, Air Force intelligence radio operator. Back then, there wasn't spy satellites and stuff we didn't get into that until the late 70s but everything was being you know uh caught in the airwaves you know radio waves and stuff where uh intelligence was always operated you know uh in that fashion over radios and stuff and ray did the same thing that jim did exact same thing and like i said they're running and in fact in a couple of their books and you can find these pictures online that picture, there's a picture of Jim at a desk and Coral's handing him some paper. That's at Hollerman Air Force Base. <laughs> That's not at their house in Tucson. That's at Hollerman Air Force Base. So they had a regular office now. Again, I don't know if that was staged, but they didn't take the picture. Someone took the picture of them, of her handing him documents at a desk in an Air Force Base. <laughs> so That's I'm going really, like, really interesting because it, um, because I personally feel like they did very, very good research, very good work on the UFO subject. I just think that the the Lorenzans and Afro were a, a total net positive to the field of UFO research, but they they had this very cozy relationship with the U.S. Air Force, very cozy yeah. relationship. Yeah, and so uh, I'm so I'm asking. So we don't know the story we... behind all of this, do we? Do we really know what was, this is all about? Well, it, it, what do you as think? Far as... Well, I, I think it, like what was I, I the Air Force about? It, I think it was the original A tip. I really do. I believe this was. Everyone asked, well, well, what happened? What uh, there was Blue Book, which was the public relations mm -hmm. arm, and but behind the scenes there was Apple. Apple was the one who was on the ground doing because they were getting information from literally all over the world, all over the world. A lot of it was from South America. Um, which has always been a hotbed, but we did get some stuff from from Asia, Japan, uh, notably. Um, uh, nothing that I recall from China or any place like that. There were a few things from the Middle East. I remember uh, they but, had they had an incredible worldwide network for that time, and actually even for today. Uh, oh, I think yeah. they rivaled MUFON, uh, what they've got going on today, but they did it yeah. decades ago. And, so and they, these, they weren't bringing in reports from all over the world. And then it was going yeah, right to the Air Force, wasn't it? it was, I believe it was going right to the Air Force. Uh, like I said, I think they were the A-tip of their time. 
and they moved to Tucson because that was a SAC Air Force Base ringed by nuclear missiles. There was hot and cold espionage going on during the Cold War. It, Tucson was in the top three targets in the United States. Um, certainly, uh, uh, Doty, the, the counter uh, Air Force Doty, counter, yeah. yeah, he was interested in Tucson at the time. And I'm sure he wasn't the only one. Um, uh, everything was going on in Tucson. You had Hughes Aircraft, who was turning out uh, you know, all kinds of you know, stuff for Vietnam and uh, for the U.S. military and for the Israeli military, too, at the time. Um, so there was all kinds of interest in, in Tucson. Who's right in the center of that? APRO. APRO's right and in the center. This is really and very important. Uh, like, this is a new perspective that I really, I hope viewers can appreciate just what you're saying here. And by the way, it sounds very persuasive to me. Everything that you're saying makes perfect sense to me. Uh, that APRO was, I like the way you put it, the original ATIP. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. a, uh, a, a method by which the military, the government, the intel community could safely, quietly get uh -huh. a lot of these reports that were happening around the world. APRO was collecting them. Uh, undoubtedly, can we assume getting financial uh, support for all of that because they, they couldn't have oh, they afforded had. it otherwise. It was too no, much. They, 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 they had to because they, they, they had no other means of support other than, than uh, uh, their pensions, if they had a pension. I mean, they weren't retirement age, uh, I, I don't think, when I met them in seven. No, 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 they were too young. Uh, and, yeah, and so, you know, where were they getting this money? Mm -hmm. Um uh, I have, I, like I said, I even suspect at the time, this is, they've got to be getting money from the government. Because now here's the other one... thing, though. It's it's complicated because, you know, Coral Lorenzen famously really hated the CIA. Or unless yes. I don't think that was for, for pretend. I mean, the CIA, yeah. we know this in the Robertson panel, they surveilled APRO. And she yeah. wrote about this and she was angry about it. Like, you can see that. So there's, there's different... Uh, there's different things going on here behind the scenes. Would would you agree with that? Well, yeah. Well, it, it's very possible seeing that Ray worked for the NSA underneath the Air Force umbrella. It's possible that Jim also, because we, we do believe that the NSA is thoroughly involved in this because they're so involved with communications and spy satellites. And these would be places where you would get you know, photographs of UFOs or, or film of UFOs sure. in space or communications uh, and stuff. So he might have been working under the same NSA umbrella that that uh, Ray was and uh, or just Air Force uh, under the Department of Defense, you know, that he, he worked there. But he was working. He, that was his expertise was the same as Ray's you know, uh, radio communication, intelligence and electronics specialists and stuff. And he never, he wasn't doing that at APRO. I go like, you know, he's not like repairing electronics in his sideline or doing anything with radio. There was no radio equipment that I knew of in his home. Back then, the, the big deal today, we have the internet, but back then ham radios were the big thing. That was the internet yeah. of the 70s. And, and you have these Remember enormous- Remember that, what was that CB radios. song? Uh Convoy. Oh, oh, convoy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the, the ham radios are, and they, they're still around today. Uh, in my work in California for emergency setup, if there's ever a major quake, like we had a quake last night, uh, if there's a quake and everything's shut down, there's a system that ham radio operators can communicate with the Red Cross and the military and everything so that we can get you know triage centers and everything together I, so I they're apologize. still out I think, there. I think convoy was for cb citizens band cb you're, it's, you're it's, talking it's, ham radio it's a little that's a I'm sorry, yeah yeah, yeah. you go into someone's home with a ham radio setup and i mean it, it took up an entire room <laughs> i mean because it's all vacuum tubes back then and stuff it wasn't digital electronics today a ham radio would set on you know be as big as a laptop, it's very small. But back then it was an entire room full of electronics and you'd have a huge antenna on your you know, array on your house. So, so Jim didn't have any of that. <laughs> you know, there was nothing, there was no indication of that he was listening or working on radios, working with electronics at all. 
he was just triaging the mail and he would say, hey, look into this, look into that. And he was so polite, so succinct, so gentlemanly, uh, very soft-spoken. Coral was back at the house writing all this stuff up, writing the books. There are eight books and the newsletters each month. And you know, from being a prolific writer yourself and writing your blogs and writing for the website and everything, that's an all-day job. You're, you're writing all the time. Yes. And that's what she did on an old Underwood typewriter, not even electric, just one of these little punch ones. It was so cute. The thing looked like it was, it, it must have been her first typewriter from back in Wisconsin, because this thing was ancient. <laughs> it, was, it was almost rusty. It was, I love it those. Was type, I used to type on an old Royal typewriter, very similar yeah. to the Underwoods. And uh, yeah. they were just a thing of joy. They were a thing of beauty. Yeah. 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 She, of, she had that on her, her little desk. It was all very neat. Their home was so small. It was a tiny little home, but it was sweet. It was the literal white picket fence with a little yard in front. It was just enough for them. They, they were a darling couple and, and they were very close. Never heard an ill, uh, you know, uh, conversation between them at all. And well, there's anyway, no way so, that they, they could afford the 51st floor oh, of the biggest building in Minneapolis, oh, 50,000 no, square feet. <laughs> no, but nobody back then would have even risked that. If you're, you're, you're thinking attractions back then, if you were going to do something like that, maybe New York, maybe Los Angeles, but Minnesota, I'm just showing this I'm again sorry. here. This is insane. Yeah. This thing is huge. Yeah, yeah I... I it, Unbelievable. Buildings like this lease uh, places, they're leased by the square footage, you know, mm -hmm. like it might be a couple of grand per square foot. And they have 15,000. Okay. So that's even at a thousand dollars per square foot, that's $15,000 a month in 78. <laughs> that's, that's not happening. That's, that's not happening. No, no. No, that's, that's insane. So, uh, and so this, this, the press release came out in 78 and go, oh, good. This is good. And I'm going like, I'm, I'm very excited because this is really fleshing out. This is really going to be something really big. And that press that and was then, November of 78? November of 78. November, 11. November 11th okay. of 78. Okay. Okay. So, so I what happened? How, how did this whole thing develop then? Okay, so uh, I don't remember if if Jim had his 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 heart surgery that uh, fall, the Christmas area, or if it was the year before. But uh, after November 11th, we had the holidays, we had Thanksgiving, Christmas, and we really didn't do much of anything. Get into the new year, and Jim approaches me, uh, you know, and says, "Hey, you know, uh, uh, my heart is not what it used to be." And, uh, you know, Coral and I are thinking of, of you know, what are we going to do when we're gone? Who are we going to, you know, entrust APRO to? We'd like you to do it. We'd like you to, we'd like to get you, you know, up to speed and you'd be doing this. And I go like, oh, yeah, I'd like to do that. I go like, this would be, this be cool. You know, I'm thinking, you know, I, I hadn't chose this course for my life, but this is evolving. And yeah, I can see myself doing this. And it was a couple of weeks after that he came over impromptu. It was in the evening, um, and, and oh hi Jim. You know he didn't. He wouldn't call. Sometimes he'd call and 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 give me information. But when he would come over, he never called before he'd come over. He'd just knock on the door, and there he was. Oh, Jim, it was all oh, about the pop in. in. Yeah, the pop in just, like we learned was, on Seinfeld. It's like he was. He did the pop. Yeah, he was like he was thinking of something and, oh, I'm going to go buy Al because he was just a couple of blocks away. So he came over. It was an evening. Uh, uh, my wife uh, wasn't there at the time. And she's on the couch. He says, oh, he says, uh, I want to talk to you about the museum. I thought, oh, I, I was a little bit concerned that, oh, maybe it's not going to happen now. Maybe the museum is going to happen. They didn't get the funding or it's not going to go forward or, or maybe there's something new, whatever. And he says, uh, uh there's really more to this museum than just the museum of Minnesota. And that's when he shared with me, it was just stone faced, looking at me straight in the eyes. He says, they want to release. And he said, they want to release the history of the United States air force, NASA, 
and the government in regards to UFOs and aliens. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, they want to release the entire history. I said, well, who? And he said, the government. That's what he said. The government. And, yeah, the government. And I, I go, in my mind, I was thinking, well, it's about time. Because <laughs> remember, I've been working on this since 74. It's now, you know, we're now into 79. Okay. This is uh, early part of 79. I'm going like, what's well, about time? You know, we've been thinking this is going to happen. Uh, there was a time in 77 when Powell said, hey, we're looking into this for the Carter administration because they were having the submarine bases buzzed. Uh, and uh, so I thought, well, it was only a matter of time. Now we're going to do it. And I thought, I knew there was something more to this museum than met the eye because no one puts this kind of money into something like this on a lawn. One museum in Minneapolis on the 51st yeah. floor. Like it's a, that's a bizarre thing. Doesn't yeah, yeah, weird? It, yeah. Oh yeah, it's, it's totally like, uh, but when- like This is our, where you're gonna put, sink all your money? Nothing against yeah. Minneapolis. It's a great city, yeah. but it's like, come on. Yeah. That's yeah, it? Yeah, you're, you're not. But as an artist, you're going like, I, I don't, it's their money. If they, <laughs> if they want to do that, it's sure, yeah. fine with me. But then it made more sense when he says, yeah, they want to do this. And I said, so so the museum is actually going to be like, like the Smithsonian. It's, he says, no. He says, what they want to do is they want to take this on the road. And they had just in 76, and a lot of your viewers are not going to understand this because they weren't there. But in, in 76, we had the bicentennial train. It was the anniversary of the, uh, the country's founding. And they took some of the most sensitive and secure documents in the country's history, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, uh, and a lot of other real artifacts, not manufactured artifacts, real artifacts, and they put them on this train that went all over the country. It was very high security, although, you know, today, uh, it would look seamless, but it was very high secure. They're, they were very concerned about the physical security of that train sure, of because course, yeah. something happened to it. I mean, there goes the security you know, nightmare, I would think. Yeah, yeah. But, and there was no, this is 76 now, no screening going into this train. There was no metal detectors or anything. Mm -hmm. You just got on the you know, train and walked through it. It was a long, you know, exhibit. Uh, um, <clears throat> And had all these interactive things where you push a button and it give you a little spiel about what you were looking at, a musket or a uniform or the, a document or whatever. And they apparently loved this. And in uh, thinking about communications at the time, and we talked about this today, what would be proof for everybody? You know, what would be proof for everybody? Everyone goes like, oh, I wouldn't believe it unless a uh, UFO land on the White House lawn. Well, okay. They have flyovers in 52, but they actually have landed on lawns in the aerial school in West, uh, in Australia. Then there was another one in, in, in the UK and Wales. Many, many times, landed. in fact. Yeah. Many, many yeah. lines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think James Fox actually uh, said close to 100 different landings over the years in schools, in, in schools. So, right. and that's just not one person it, in Ariel, uh, Mac recorded 66 interviews, but there was over 100 witnesses. So they have had mass studies. They have had the West, that's West All Australia. Australia. Yeah. That's a yeah. heck of a case. Yeah, yeah. 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 So they've, they've had this and people say, I don't believe it. Okay. So how are you going to get everyone to believe it? Jim said what they want to do is load up all this stuff onto the train that was formerly the bicentennial train and take it around so everyone can have a firsthand look at it. They can see it, they can touch it. I said, what do you mean, like Roswell? And he goes, yes. I said, they're gonna have the Roswell craft on this train. He said, yes. I said, what about bodies? He says, yeah, because that was one of my big things. Like I said, biological, you know, I wanted to do a book, a phylum, you know, all these creatures. He says, yes. So there's so, gonna be like recreations of the bodies, uh, like a museum no, quality were, level no. presentation. No, nope. they were going to be the bodies. The real bodies. The bodies. The He's, real bodies. Jim Lorenzen said to you, 
said to they're me, gonna have real alien bodies yes, on this because train. This was, this, this was the kicker. This was how they were gonna convince the American people that this was a real thing. It wasn't, because if you had recreations, well, so what? Yeah, right, a exactly. It's what it looks like. Uh, and that, as soon as he said they were gonna have bodies, I connected with that that uh, face, the plaster face, the life cast. For the Let's show that one again here. I've got that. Uh, there we go. Let's share this. That guy. I that immediately one. thought, okay, now I know where they got this. This is from one of the bodies. This is, that's how they got, that's why I've never seen this again. And by the that's way. That's why, so when you talk, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, no, no. There are a number of uh, witnesses of the early crashes, and I'm thinking, I think with Roswell, but uh, definitely witnesses went on the record to say they did not look like our archetypal gray with the big black eyes. In fact, one of them said they look like us, but smaller. He said they were kind of nice. They weren't bad looking. They were kind of nice looking little guys. And when you see this, like that's kind of the image that I always had. And that's what well, we're go, looking at here. Go back to that that other image again. Yeah. Again, look at this, this left eye here and the little indentation there. When you see a cadaver, one of the things that happens after death uh, and a mort what morticians will do, people don't realize this, it's, I hope I'm not grossing anybody out, but they actually, like it's like a lens that they put underneath the eyelid to make the eyes look, the uh, eyelids look natural in death. Because uh -huh. what happens is the body dehydrates and the eyes sink in and you get mm -hmm. like these little indentations like this here. And uh, I go on like, that's not something you sculpt in. You don't sculpt like that. You would yeah. make it, you know, biometrically symmetrical. And you never sculpt a subject with the eyes closed in death. Why would you do that? You're, you're, you're trying to you know, portray right, this. Exactly. Alien. What a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Why, why would you do the eyes closed? So I'm so immediately I thought, okay, that's where they got this. This is this was a life cast uh, you know, of one of these or a death mask of one of these aliens. And they needed something. They had a treasure trove of, of stuff. I've heard so often times, I've heard it from Lazar, I've heard it from, uh, oh, what's his name, with, with the um, NATO, who just passed away, he was a member of APRO, uh, uh, you know Bob, Bob about? Dean. Bob Dean. Yeah. Uh, he said he saw pictures of, of dead aliens uh, in the uh, uh, UN files. And, and I'm going like, they have a treasure trove of this stuff and, and they need something for the press release for that museum. This is interesting. We don't have the Barney, Betty Barney Hill sculpts yet, we'll use this. And they just throw out, because no one knew what it was or where it came from. So, so yeah, we use this. I want to back up. So Jim Lorenzen's telling you, they're going to take no. this museum and they're going to put it on the train like they did on the Bicentennial. No. And they're no. going to go across the country, this massive exhibit to demonstrate the reality of the UFO subject and of aliens. And it's going to include alien bodies, among other things. That's what exactly. Jim Lorenzen yeah. said to you. That's made the government yeah. in 1979. Exactly. In 1979. Mind you, there's a person here. That's just an incredible revelation. Uh, it, it's, again, it's funny because I think back, what it, it's like, you remember what you were feeling and thinking and stuff at, at the time, uh, different things happening in your life. And I remember hating the idea of the vice dentist trade because I go like, oh, that's so corny. You know, I, I really, I thought, you know, I'm a young guy and, and, and I, I, I thought the bicentennial train itself was corny. Now we're going to roll this out, this important subject. We're going to roll this out, you know, uh, on train. But looking back on it now, I go like, no, this makes perfect sense because it's the only way you're going to get around. Given the way the country was at the time, you don't have any internet. You only have three networks. If you showed it on TV, which maybe they were going to, have you know carter come out and say hey we're going to do this and show some pictures right. and then you get to see it in person but it you have to see it in person because even seeing it in person there there are going to be people that are going to go like oh no they made that up you know that's not a real ship they nope. made that up but but i'm going to 
I'm going to share one more uh, image. This is of the Hopkinsville aliens. And this you did this yeah. in uh, spring of 79, it looks like. And yeah. this is also yeah. going to be part for part of this. Uh, yeah. and, and for those people who may know their UFO history, this is from 1955, this encounter. Kelly, uh, yeah, Kelly's, uh, Kelly family, no, the Kelly. Yeah. It, Hopkinsville, uh, yeah. Kelly yeah. family in Hopkinsville, uh, Kentucky. And this is really nice drawing. This is yours. Yeah. 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 And yeah, you were going to do, do a, a model of this? Yeah. Full scale sculpt of that. That would have been life size because they were only a couple of feet tall. They were, they, they were very, they, they, they remind me of hairless lemurs kind of, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind yeah. of a cross yeah. between a reptile and a lemur. Uh, and I was going to do a full scale uh, model that Coral loved that case. She was very interested in that case. She felt it had a lot of, good um uh, it's a weird case like that family got ripped by the the public you know they were like drunk they were this no one believed them but those people always seemed very sincere like it's a really weird it's one of those cases that i wish didn't happen almost because it doesn't fit it doesn't fit our preconceived ideas about how this should be but here it is it's like yeah and, and the daughter is the daughter is still around. She's she's still alive, and and she's she's done some speaking, very limited, but oh. she still speaks about it. Interesting. Uh, you know, it, it's, people really, we can't lose track of our critical thinking and our deductive reasoning when we look at these things and get off on metaphysical tangents. I have no problem with <clears throat> philosophy or the psychology involved in these things and metaphysics i'm a believing christian and i do believe in a metaphysical world i think that what we're looking at in these things are nuts and bolts kinds of things i don't think yeah i don't think alien i don't think angels are coming down to take skin samples and dna and when people talk about well how in the world you know why would they be crashing all the time it's space travel we almost crashed in our first attempt on the moon. We were 20 seconds from crashing that limb on the moon. Mm -hmm. He had, uh, Armstrong had 20 seconds left of fuel. They, they planned that landing site, but when they got there, it had all kinds of rocks and boulders. They couldn't land there. So they had to find another place to land. And 20 seconds left. It was almost a disaster. We've only done a couple of times. We have planes crashing all the time. Yeah, yeah. This is space travel from another solar system. All kinds of things could happen. Oh, that's uh, a very good point. I mean, you know, they could have medical problems. I mean, how many times uh, uh, that someone have a heart attack here on this planet and crash a plane or, or there's something unexpected happens. So it, it's, it's not as bizarre as, as I think people imagine. They're always conflating. Like if you went back to the 18th century and showed them uh, a stealth fighter and you told them, yeah, sometimes these things crash, they wouldn't believe you. They go like, my God, something like that. You're such high technical expertise and this magic and this this black plane that flies. It couldn't possibly crash. Oh, yeah, they, they crashed. That's a good point. Yeah. So how did this whole project not happen? Like, what what went wrong? Well, at, that, at, that, at that point, <clears throat> uh, it was just like, okay, these things aren't going into the IDS center. They might be stationed there or, or, or um, triaged there. But yeah. eventually, this is all going to go into the train. Right. And they're preparing this. Well, of course, at this time, we had the Iran hostage situation, which was... Uh, this was uh, political I, I, murder for Carter. This just killed his presidency. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, right. I, I had a, a friend of mine was... Uh, her father was one of the people that was captured in the embassy there. I remember we were on a set when the announcement that they had <clears> taken the... <throat> consulate and she started crying i go well why why are you upset she says oh my dad is the agriculture ambassador <laughs> there and i go oh you know because i i said said to her before she told me that i said oh the marines will be in there tonight and they'll you know get everybody out and of course it, that didn't happen yeah. but it destroyed the carter administration and and oh the economy people think the economy is bad now oh my god you're talking double digit you're talking 18% inflation, not 8%. It was like way up there. Uh, uh, the home prices, because I was trying to buy a home at the time, it was double digit for a mortgage. I mean, you can't, can't imagine how bad it was. Mm -hmm. And of course we had uh, gas. You're lining up for gas. You go line up, uh, 
license plate, alternate license plate. So uh, President Carter had two things. Hey, let's get their minds off this. Let's do something else. Let's go, you know, I'm done with this oil. This is a problem. We have this other technology. They're hiding it from everybody. Let's get this off the ground. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off. That's how I look back at it now, that this is what's the thinking going on. And then he didn't become president. Now, uh, that hadn't stopped me from uh, um, working on it up until the very time that he didn't get elected. Uh, continued to make models and, and ship them to who knows where and never well, got any of those. So this, but Carter, I mean, lost the election to Reagan in 1980. So that we're talking November yeah. of 1980. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't think things were looking good for him throughout 79. I, I think that's fair yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it was in March of 79, because I've, I've been trying to know, because I know the exact date and time of my first incident. That was uh, July the 12th at 7.30 p.m. No, exactly. In 1979. 74, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, the oh, first your, your first sighting. I'm, yeah. Yeah, the first 1974, sighting. July 12th, 7.30 p.m. The, the one the that freaked one, you out. Yeah, that. The would, one that freaked me out, I'm, I'm putting in March probably the middle of March, because it was already warm then. It was already- Of 79. Nine. 79, yeah. So this was after Jim had already you know, said, hey, this is gonna be the train and we're gonna do this. Because he told me that early part of 79. This is after the museum uh, press release in 78, November of 78, going into 79. Jim says, hey, I'm not, you know, my heart's not what it should be. We want you to take over and what do you know? This museum is just a trial balloon for this train they want to do. And we're going to roll the train out. We want you to, you know, keep making the models and we're going to do this. And during that time, we also, uh, I was part of, uh, of that movie, UFOs Are Real. Um, well, let's show the uh, image for that. I've got yeah. that right here. Um, there. You yeah, see it? There we go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that uh, that was one of the the uh, alien models. That was a half scale model that I did that was shipped to who knows who. <laughs> did you make this uh, model that we're looking at here? Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. your creation. Yes, that's my creation. Yeah, yeah. That that's uh, that was a half scale model of the Grays, uh, based on really based on Betty's description, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it it matched uh, um, uh, Herman's description and. And also Moody's description. I mean, it was, but this was my creation. And uh, we shipped it off. I, I, again, you know, went supposedly to the museum. Don't know what whatever happened to it. Never saw it again. It was used in the film uh, a couple of times. I, I think Wendell showed it. You don't see Wendell showing it, but you just see the face of it. In uh, here we go. Wait, I've got it right. It's at that newspaper article down there. Yeah. Yeah. The it, letter that, from Wendell to you. Yeah, that, that's uh, Wendell wanted me to make another one for him. He really loved that little sculpture. Uh, but it was a full body. That's just the head. He's got his hands there. But there was a full body with a uniform. And I have that picture somewhere. I'll, I'll, I'll get that, scan that to you. You can show it some other time. Well, this is cool. So this is what he's holding here at the bottom of this is the same thing as yes. uh, this. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the head. He but needed it, to talk to whoever the made the, the poster to get rid of that damn apostrophe in the word UFO. Uh, it's Canadian. The the <laughs> hunt uh, was Canadian, uh, so I don't know if they use that in Canada. Maybe it's right. British. So, but no, this <laughs> is amazing that you made this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I had a little uh, uh, interview in the film, but it ended up on the cutting room floor. I had uh, that morning. I had four wisdom teeth uh, extracted. But I thought, oh, no problem. I can still do this interview. <laughs> I want to find this film. I think I think I may have seen this years oh, ago. You can, but it's this on is... Tubi. It's on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. And it is rated as the best UFO documentary of the 70s. Because there were a lot of, there was, yeah. you know, uh, Von Daniken's uh, UFO, uh, you know, mm -hmm. stuff, uh, documentary. But this is considered the best. The only thing in this film, they open with that Catalina... Um, film footage of the UFO over Catalina Island, which we at APRO debunked. We go like, no, this is an airplane. This is a Piper Cup. And it's flying at 125 miles an hour. 
and we sent the the frames to the Kodak Center uh, up in Phoenix. Yeah. And when you blow it up, you can see the shadow of the wing on the side of the plane. It's a Piper Cub landing at Catalina Airport. But they in the movie they go, "Here's a real UFO," and that's what they open with. I go like, "No, it's oh uh, that that really infuriated me when I saw they opened with that because they have a lot of other good stuff in there, but that's one, not, and that's that still one. today often touted as a real UFO film footage, and it's oh, it's not. Well, Catalina Island's got it, a lot of a lot of stuff going on there, but I guess not that. So I want to yeah, just that, uh, that was part of <laughs> can, can we just go through the dissolution of this project again? So yeah, Carter had all these political problems. Definitely did not get reelected. Yeah. Clearly, that harmed him, the whole project. But did Jim Lorenz? And then you had your very uh, bizarre experience, which we discussed previously, in which it Gosh. seemed like you were taken, you were abducted, uh, yeah. and and you decided from that moment you were going to do the slow walk out of ufology, but not, yeah, it not was immediately. A day, yeah, it was a day-to-day -day situation. It was like, it was like I was trying to forget it. You know, just right. like, okay, just work through this. It, you so know, how, did the, how did the whole thing just come to you? And like, how did, did Jim just one day say, sorry, this is not happening. We're going to, no, the whole thing's on no, ice. How, how did it, no, how did no. it? Yeah. I was offered, I was offered a job uh, in California, uh, with, with, I was with my first wife. Uh, we wanted to get out of Tucson. You know, there really uh, was more opportunity in California at that time. In fact, when we moved to California, oh my God, there were so many jobs. I mean, there was just, it was huge. It was really booming. Uh, and you would literally, there were billboards with all the job listings like in the Irvine area, you just go down the street and all these places were hiring. It was just Amazing. incredible. Uh, it was really the golden state. <laughs> and uh, I was offered actually two jobs uh, in model making and engineering, doing prototypes. And it's very similar, government stuff, private industry and everything. And I thought, oh, this is my opportunity because they were going to pay my way out and uh, you know, I could, we could believe the, you know, we had a very nice today people might frown on, but it's a very nice double wide trailer back then. Today, people look back at trailer and go, trailer. Now this is a beautiful double wide trailer. If you were inside that living room, you would think you were in a house. It was very, mm -hmm. very nice. And, uh, um, but this was an opportunity to get a real house in a, you know, real nice. It was an upgrade. And I'm going like, well, I can stay here and work for APRO. Oh, well, I can work with APRO from California just to say, you know, it's like easy now. It's giving myself the slow no, looking for excuses to get out of it. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I continued making the models and, you know, giving them to Jim and he was setting them out. There was you never a- Through 1979, you continued yeah, to until, work for APRO. Yeah, in fact, they were still mailing me stuff as late as 82. If you look at, at some of the letters I sent okay. you from, from Ray, that those are dated 82. So I just there. wasn't responding. I'm so sorry. Jim never really explained to you any other details about this exhibit, the train uh, thing. Well, I do. I, I do when when the when Carter didn't get what it was very clear that he was not going to be reelected. And I was for Reagan, <laughs> you know, I didn't look at it as like, hey, if Reagan gets elected, this is going to go south. I, I you know, I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind that this was wholly a Carter administration project. And if someone else took over, this might get deep six. I'm just saying it's the government. They're going to release it. The NASA's involved. The Air Force is involved. <clears throat> this is going to happen. And I just continued to work go as if and looking at my options hey they're offering me money to go to california and and you know this is going to be a pro job you know working government and a nice laboratory such situation when it was when, when i got there it was a very nice situation and i worked for a number of companies when i got to california uh, all of them did government work uh and i got to work on really cool stuff that it's it, People don't understand this stuff is always a decade before it's released. Always. Uh, this was when I got to California, the first computer I worked on of uh, doing a prototype for it 
-hmm. was a holographic computer. This was 1980, a holographic computer that would sit on your desk. How, how and, is it holographic? Uh, it had a, a real interesting uh, uh, engineering technique. They had a large metal plate. This plate was almost an inch thick. And it vibrated at a high rate of speed. It was on like these springs. And lasers, there were three lasers, each a different color, would collect and hit on this, this vibrating plate. And because the plate vibrated faster than you could see, it made the, the image that was projected by the lasers, the holograms, look 3D. It was an optical illusion, but you had a, a little uh, joystick that you could turn it around and look at different angles of it, but it was basically an optical illusion. Would this be used and, for like manufacturing, fabrication purposes, yeah, for, that type of thing? Yeah, yeah, to look at, you know, like if you're going to do a geometric shape or mm. an engineering, uh, like a, a chassis or vehicle and stuff, you could project it in here. It was the console itself would fit on a desk, but the, the uh, electronics was, Think of a, a, a 1980s video game, you know, that the type of consoles like that, but you have the, the screen up here. That's about the size it was. Wow. Now, I was working on the, the metal plate, which had to be very precise, had to be completely level, had to engineer that so it would, you know, be cut off. But we were doing the prototype for that. That was 1980. That was amazing. That thing, was it anything as thing, cool as like Princess Leia on Star Wars. Remember that? Yeah, that was, that, right? that's, yeah, that's exactly, I go like, oh, this is, this is that what this was like? Yeah, that was exactly what it was like. But you were looking into this monitor, you know, it was open. It wasn't like a glass, there would have been glass on front of it to prevent okay, damage. I see, yeah. But it was, it, you're looking into it it's and amazing. You, can, you can, you turn, like I said, that was 1980. There were a lot of things that we, we worked on in those, the, the early 80s they never did come, but that's very common. It's very common. I remember one time we were working at, now they're very common, these uh, uh, stoves, these ranges that use sound to cook things. Have you seen those? They're, they're, I don't think so, I'm not sure. Uh, they're, they're like a ceramic top stove, but they don't use electricity. They use sound. You have to have the right type of cookware and it, it causes the, the metal to heat up because of the sonic vibration in it. We worked on that in the early 80s. And I said, oh, this is going to be so cool when these get out. And they go like, no, they start coming out now. I said, well, when are they coming out? This was electric. We're using this and for I the said, human well, alien base on the far side of the moon. Sorry. No, 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 no. no. He says, we're, these aren't coming out until we get rid of all the gas ranges that we're selling now. <laughs> he yeah. says, we got like three million Down gas technology. ranges. And yeah. until those are gone. We're not, this isn't even, got, no one's even going to know about this. So, and, and those only came out a couple of years ago. I mean, it's been decades. It, it exists. But so I work on technology that. does like yeah. sound. Oh, uh, yeah, you can, you, yeah, yeah, you can go out, you can go to Sears and buy one right now. Ah, yeah, they're, they're, they're out there. It's, it's, you have to have the, yeah, it's kind of a gimmick in that you have to buy the, the same cookware to use on the stove but there's no heat you can you can touch that burner and there's no heat at all you don't feel like i've seen those so that's using sound technology in some that's sort? using sound yeah it's using sound i it's, had no idea it, that's incredible yeah, it, yeah and we worked on that in the, in the 80s so, so there's a lot of that you know so that's what i was looking at going to do and i thought well i can do app i can still do apro you know and it'd be better to do apro in california anyway and they like i said they were sending me stuff but the, the museum there was after carter was gone it was just saying oh, i guess this isn't going to happen because they were asked. so there no one no ever more... talked to you about that like jim just stopped giving you assignments for, yeah, for that whole museum. project basically yeah yeah because yeah. it, it it i left it would have been uh i spent i i went uh, november of 79 is when i took my first job there in Southern California. Was in so that County. was when the press release happened as well. So when the, no, press, no, no. Re the press release was the year before. 78, sorry. Okay. 78, yeah, November 78. So this is a year later. You, you moved. Yeah. yeah, I moved. Okay. And um, uh, uh, was there uh, in Southern California. And, you know, I was like, ah, 
you know, I, I, so it just kind of like, it just sort of like faded away. It sounds like that's, you know, this would be a good thing for researchers. No. Yeah, I was giving them the slow no. I, I can't say it was a, it was a burden. There was a lot of stuff going on. I mean, I, I had a lot of personal stuff going on too. You know, uh, uh, I was married to my high school sweetheart. This is a big move for us. I wanted to write by her and we we're going to have this new life and nice house and yeah. move out of the trailer and all this. So those things were on my mind too. And I wanted to do a good job and, you know, rise in the company, the company that I was working for, they had promised me, Hey, you know, a partnership within that and you're going to move up and all this stuff. Um, so those things were on my mind too. It wasn't just a, I didn't have a one track mind. There's a lot of people that get into UFOs or any other type of, of thing. And that's it. That's their life. This is what they get up and they breathe. And I was, you know, distancing myself from that. Uh, I, cause I had all these other, I got to make a living, <laughs> you know, I got to do no, these it's understandable. Things. You and your and, and, young guy. Yeah. Yeah. And this, thing you know with the the ufo in march you know where i saw this thing land in my driveway i just go like if i ever tell anybody that they're gonna think i've lost my mind and i'm never gonna you know like i said i'd seen what it did to other people's lives it destroyed them you know even people that were centered and and had good lives and and were older than me and go like man this just messed them up there there were professors you know there were people like Jacobs and Mac and 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 Ray Fowler who had you know done well but again it was still fringe back then these weren't people that were they all paid the price shows. anyway they yeah. all paid the price yeah oh absolutely I mean uh Mac they tried to drive him out even Avi Loeb today he, he, they they still pressure him mm -hmm. and he's a well-known uh, uh, astronomer and they're trying to they they're always trying to and so much of what people are seeing today this this stuff about why the government is really not disclosing this that's all propaganda they they really try and press I, I really feel people sorry for people someone like Bob Lazar who still gets crap all the time I go like I was in the intelligence field I know what he's saying is rings true everything he shared so much of it has been proven true and they still get on and they still get on and that's really the government is doing that they don't want you to believe it because it's a threat to everything that's being done they don't want you to be destabilized or the country or any government to be destabilized like hey we got these guys we've got the supermodels <laughs> of government that are out here that we've hidden from you they wanted to meet you, but we didn't let them. We told them you wouldn't be interested. You, you have to go through us to talk to our people, and we're not going to let you do that. And in, on the back, they don't trust these aliens any more than they trust us. And they have these different projects, and Kit Green can attest to this, ways that they could bring these things down. And if you want to look to why a lot of these things crash, I wouldn't put it by that they were brought down, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it still mystifies me why these things can go into uh, uh, a government uh, uh, zone of operation, like off the East coast there, where they, they had the uh, 19, uh, the 2015 daily contact with these Tic Tacs out there, not the 2004 one, but the ones in the, off the East coast, the USS Roosevelt's encounters. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and they did nothing. If they really suspected these were Chinese drones, what the hell? They're in a restricted area. You try and fly a Piper Cub into that, and you get your your rear end shot down. No way were they and, Chinese drones. Yeah, no of way. course not. Of course not. Again, that's it's propaganda. These are the same people that told you all these things: the Russia collusion stuff, and now the border is secure. Right. Are you going? Are you kidding me? How can if a UFO land on the White House lawn, they would say, no, it, it, you didn't see that. It didn't happen. That's right. <laughs> it never happened. Yeah, again, all these school landings, they always go, oh, no, it didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. You know, you can't believe them. And, and you talk to the witnesses, and they've all been threatened. 
by government people, the, the, the Australian science teacher was threatened. If you come forward with this, we're going to tell everyone you, you're uh, a, uh, a drunk and you're going to be fired from the school and all this. They threatened him. And he didn't talk about it for another 20, 30 years, you know, because he was so, so intimidated. Um, so, and, and that's still going on to this day. They, they obfuscate and they create these uh, narratives that get people chasing angels and interdimensionals. And, and, and I'm not saying that out of the thousands and thousands of cases that there might be a time traveler in there somewhere. Uh, I'm not saying that. So, so I, I don't want people to misinterpret that I'm, I'm saying that, oh, this, this, there's nothing but nuts and bolts. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there's a lot of obfuscation out there. And why do they say interdimensionals or time travelers? Because you can't get to them. Yeah. You can't. And get I to think them. what you're saying is there may not be all nuts and bolts, but there's a lot of nuts and bolts. Yeah. There's yeah. There's, there's a lot. And the government <clears throat> doesn't want you to follow the nuts and bolts. They don't want you to follow I, that. I agree with they, you. They want you, follow, they want you to chase the interdimensionals or the time travelers because you can never get there. If someone is actually time traveling back here, they're not doing it every day. Mm -hmm. They're not taking their time traveling craft and hovering it over somebody's house in a residential area at 2.30 in the morning and hanging out there. That's not happening. They're not appearing in the wastelands of, of, of Tibet, uh, you know, above a mountaintop there and, and, for no reason whatsoever, what would they be studying there? Time travelers aren't going to those areas and they're not doing it every day. The same way with interdimensionals, why would, I mean, if they're that sophisticated and they have the entire universe in their dimension to explore, why would they come back here to this particular dimension every day, every day? Because UFO reports are every day. Every single day. And they're not they're not in the middle of the night. They're, everyone's, oh, why is it only in their bedrooms? It's not always in their bedrooms. Of course not. The first one I saw was, began in, you know, twilight, began at sunset. It turned dark quickly, but I was wide awake driving. It wasn't something I fell asleep and woke up and saw. Yeah, I was wide awake, standing outside my car. I saw it as plain as day, and nice. there's absolutely nothing that was sway me. Same way with in March of 79, when I looked out that window, I saw that thing land in the driveway. I still I go back and I think of how in the hell did they land? <laughs> no one could, uh, but it happened so often. Like uh, Deborah landed in her backyard. Betty Andreessen landed in her backyard. And we always think, oh, no one else saw it. No, with Betty Andreessen, other people did see it. With right. Deborah, other people did see it. They just didn't say anything about it. And so I presume that maybe I think that nobody else saw this thing land there. But we were on the edge of the city, you know, almost in the desert. And it, there, there were houses, but it eh, wasn't that close. And 11 o'clock in Tucson in, in 79, that's pretty much everyone's in bed. <laughs> you yeah. know, it wasn't a wild town with a lot of things going on. So so, but they don't want you to, to focus on that. They don't want you talking to people that saw these things. Uh, it, it's like when Marco Polo came back from China, the, you know, he wrote the accounts and it was years later that people finally thought, well, maybe there is something to this Marco Polo stuff, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but if you go back historically, the Greeks met the Chinese, you know, back in, in BC, 130 BC. The Chinese wanted to get Greek horses. They had a settlement in the, in the Middle East there. And there was actually a little war that took place between the Chinese and the Greeks there because the Greeks didn't want to give up the horses and the Chinese only had ponies and they wanted the horses. I want to look into that. I didn't know that one. Yeah, yeah. It'd make a great movie, that, that, <laughs> that incident. Yeah. But, but it, now they don't want you talking. That's why they don't want you going back uh, in these... UAP files. They don't want you going back to the older cases and why investigators need to go back to those older cases because I can hear I hear in these podcasts and these interviews, people don't know what's happened. 
They don't know what's gone before. Why is there any good pitchers? There are hundreds of good pitchers. You've showed many of them on your site. You've mm -hmm. done your reviews of the it, through the seventies and stuff, and you've shown the best pitchers of those days. But there is film footage, eight millimeter film footage. There is videotape. There are great stuff there. Multiple eyewitness accounts from different angles in different. I remember Wendell had a photograph that was taken over Manhattan from two different areas in Manhattan in broad daylight, viewed by hundreds of people. I've never seen that anywhere. It was We're going to have to cover this in another interview. I'm going to have to do this sure. because there's too much. You've got yeah. too many good stories. Yeah. We're, we're going to have to come back. I, I really right. do want to have a, an sure. interview before with you. But I think this is a good place to, uh, to wind yeah. this one down because you actually have done, this is a real service, Alan. I, I, this might be my favorite of our conversations. Um, I have to, I'm going to have to review them all because they're all good. But this is, um, this is something that researchers really need. Someone has got to go in to, and look for any kind of records of the Carter or Reagan administrations and, and really try to look for evidence of this plan, uh, yeah. a kind of disclosure using the train system that was used for the bicentennial train to display the UFO evidence. This is an incredible uh, statement. And I mean, there's no reason that I should doubt anything that you've said here. You provided um, the press release, you provided a lot of the artwork, the mock-up of the display itself in the um, in Minneapolis. Right. Like it, this, this all seemed to be in the works. Uh, the way that Jim Lorenzen was talking about this with you, uh, it's very suggestive of deep government connections and and what we might call a, a, a disclosure attempt that was in the works. This is surprising to me. I mean, when you look back at the early Jimmy Carter, the first year of his presidency, it was 1977. Many people know this, but just as a recap, Jimmy Carter had been a UFO witness and as a candidate in 76, talked about having seen what may have been a UFO. This made the news and people got excited. And Jimmy Carter was was asked about this a lot and as a candidate, and he said, well, if I'm elected president, you know, he did the basic blah, blah. Hillary Clinton said almost the same thing years later. If I'm president, I will release whatever I can if, as long as it doesn't affect national security. But for him to say that in the 70s was, that was the first. That was the first for any presidential candidate. And I think he was keeping that promise at the end of his administration. That Maybe that his, was it. He, 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 know, did, he, got mail, he got mailbags worth of uh, of people writing to him all through 77. It was this is very well known. And uh, one thing that I had known about, and I think others knew, was that he had made an initial attempt with NASA in 77 to get NASA to be the kind of new project blue book. And NASA just uh, dragged his feet and, and basically said no. And they had the CIA apparently supporting them in that. And as far as I knew, that whole thing ended by the end of 1977. And as far as I knew at the time, Jimmy Carter basically washed his hands of it and was done. But that's not true from what you're saying. We've got this. Now, I don't know if it's from Carter himself or some other government source, but it's important. Well, I think it's it's interesting what the, the ones that, that Jim laid out were the Air Force and NASA. I had never thought about NASA. And this blows my mind because NASA was so... But he, he, yeah, he specifically said the Air Force and NASA. Nothing was mentioned of the Navy. No one said, yeah, the Navy's going to be involved in it. And I was aware the Navy was involved in space. Well, you go back to Project Vanguard, initially, space exploration was initially handed off to the Air uh, for, to, yeah. to the Navy, but they kind of blew it with Vanguard. And then the Air Force jumped in and, and they took over. And yeah. it was the Air Force and NASA ever since then. And you know, uh, uh, NASA is all, it's, I, it can't, I can't even say it's a secret space program within NASA because there, you know, there's a lot of open source information, Project Gambit and Hexagon and, and Corona are all open source information. Those were spy satellites, part of the military industrial mm -hmm. complex that they mm -hmm. launched under the cover of basically space exploration. Uh, those satellites were all built right here in Palo Alto. And uh, they had plans of putting a manned um, secret type space station observation 
uh, platform uh, just before digital telemetry became a thing. Uh, and that wasn't discovered until recently when they found the suits of the astronauts that were going to be part of that secret platform. Uh, okay. They were going to be uh, basically like a small space station that would be observing in real time with photographic equipment and stuff, looking down at the earth and taking photographs of Russia and China and all that stuff. But that plan was all scuttled, but that was all part of NASA. And, and again, that's open source. It's nothing secret. You can, you can look that up and I won't send you emails about it. You'll have to see because I, the, the audience should know that I send uh, backup information to Richard on all this stuff I talked about. I don't just, Tell them a, you know, many, many emails. That is true. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It, with, with the links on the, the university papers mm -hmm. or the documents, it's, it's nothing. I'm just making it up out of whole cloth and tell the story. Mm -hmm. I'm sending him the backup. This is where this comes from. And I don't, I know if I was in Richard's place, I'd go like, oh my God, why is this guy sending me all this stuff? I know. It's all good. <laughs> but it, it's, it's there in the background. If you ever need it, it's there. So it, it, it's uh, when I share these things, it's I'm not just, you know, sharing it. Oh, this thing. I have backup for this stuff. So, uh, yeah, Carter had promised that he was going to release this stuff. I think this was his last opportunity to do it. He might have thought, hey, the chances are I'm going to get get kicked out. I'm not going to be in a, you know, a second term or maybe I can turn that around if I release this stuff and get this thing going and. It just didn't happen, unfortunately. It's it's very very unusual, and it's puzzling to me. Certain things don't still don't fit in my vision of how I th I thought things worked. Uh, I would never have expected NASA in any way, shape, or form to be promoting this type of a thing. Uh, nor I, the I, Air Force, I, I for that they, matter. I think the they were they were going to be drag kicking and screaming. It's kind of like uh, like Bob Lazar. If someone and you've alluded to this in your last video. In times of chaos, there's the opportunity to let the dogs of war slip, you know. Okay, oh, yeah. this is my members uh, video from my website. Right, right. Yeah, you, you can just okay. There's all this chaos. I'll tell you what. I know where that ship is, and if I just release it, no one can stop me. And that's what Bob did. Bob just went out and said, "Okay, that they're pissed at me already. I'm just going to release it and just let the cards." It's, that's oh, actually yeah that's right that's right and, and i think that's what carter was going to do it's just like okay once i get this going i don't care if nasa doesn't want to do it they can't stop now i'm the okay. president of the united states and i'm telling you nasa has the goods on this and they need to come clean so your best the best theory may be that this was actually a jimmy carter thing not a nasa thing not even an air force thing but maybe oh, no, carter was... found a way to strong arm Oh yeah, uh, it, it, no, I, I know it for, for certain. That, it, what it, you it think? Was, yeah, absolutely. Carter loved trains. Remember uh, back at that time, the Russians had this mobile train missile system. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually uh, uh, like on, basically on semi trucks. Basically, they're running these exactly. missiles around. Exactly. Yeah. And Carter proposed this big uh, uh, train operated. ICBM system, where we were going to have uh, ICBMs on train tracks using the, the country's train system to move around. So, so he, he was very much into the, you know, the, the train systems of the country. And again, today, we don't think about the trains. We don't even think how important the trains are today. Uh, uh, but 80% of all our chemicals in the entire country are shipped via rail. If the train systems disappeared, like they were going to go on strike, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't shut down the country. It would shut down the planet. Mm. You, you would literally stop everything. You think the COVID shutdowns were bad? Those trains stop, everything on this planet stops. Yeah, It, 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 would, okay. it, it would be years. So he was very much into the trains. And so looking back on it, using the bicentennial train museum concept, yeah. As a, a way of getting this out, yeah, that was all him. This is a really interesting uh, concept. And I mean, I can't say we know this is how it went down, but it sure seems like this could be how it went down. Well, the, that Jimmy Carter really was pushing the, this. I'm the IDS said somebody 
somebody with big bucks was pushing that IDS center. They had two sources, uh, Blue Book, which was closed, and APRO. APRO had funding from somebody. And it, it wasn't the generosity of strangers. I think what you're offering here, this is a significant, I mean, for me, I, I'm, I'm just tripping out here. But I think for a lot of other people who know, or who we all thought we knew this history, uh, you're presenting some very, very radically different information. A, I think the two big takeaways for me in this conversation, APRO as an original version of ATIP. Huh? I think that's very on point. I think it's very suggest, uh, suggestive and, and probably truthful. And then the other the other thing is this, this maneuver, this movement, probably from Jimmy Carter himself. As, this is incredible to me. Now, uh, I, I have spoken this to people presentation within, you know, the law enforcement apparatus about this. The only other person I, I, I spoke to a friend in it, and I said, you know, they, they tried to disclose this before. And they, they said to me, you know what, it's time that they, they do it again, is what they told me. Uh, um, so indicating that he was aware of this previous attempt? No, no, he, oh, he, no. I, I just shared with him, I said, you're going to laugh. I, I said, you're going to laugh when you hear this, what they wanted to do, how they wanted to release this. And uh, um, he says, you know, I shared the whole thing. He says, so he, he didn't even blink an eye. And he goes, I thought, nah, maybe he doesn't even believe me. But he, he knew me for a long, long time. And we've worked on many cases together. And before he got in his car, he said, you know, he says, uh, you know, I said, I don't know if they're, they're going to do it this time, but I'd, I'd like to see him really open up and disclose. And he says, I think it's about time that they, they should. He said, it should come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, he's uh, a very well-placed guy. And someone whose name I've shared with you. So you, you can, you can double check that I had that conversation with him. Yeah. So I don't want to say it here, but no, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, so, yeah, it, that, that you got Afro and Blue Book, the only people <laughs> involved in this museum, 15,000 square feet, trial balloon. What we really want to do is have this mobile museum. This yeah. bicentennial. Well, the, the last the last thing that should be mentioned here uh, before we wrap this up is that you personally you actually have been the missing link to this whole story because you are someone who was actually deeply involved in all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you knew the Lorenzans both very well. You lived there in the town with them and and, and, and you were intimately involved in this project and, and you have not spoken about this publicly to anybody else. So I guess, you know, on that basis, and then the Lorenzans, they clearly didn't talk about it. And you know, five, six years later, they're gone. And and then the whole story just kind of faded away. Yeah, there and are so, people that yeah. I, I spoke to, um, uh, you know, contemporarily, they're still alive. And I've shared their names with you. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, like the drawing that I did of the train, the bicentennial train, uh, it was going to be the UFO uh, museum, traveling museum. I, I showed that, when I did that rendering, I showed it to a contemporary of mine, you know, just get like, hey, what do you think that I'm doing this cool project? And and I can tell you then, uh, even if, you know, that person, he wasn't involved in UFO investigation, but he, again, didn't think, oh, th we weren't surprised that this was all going to come out because we all suspected, yeah, this is, this is what's going on. There was always like, as we've talked about before, oh, no one knew about Roswell. No, we did know about Roswell. We, we, we suspected they had bodies. We this was yeah. common knowledge. It wasn't even, you know, the the Air Force doesn't put out in a newspaper clipping. We got a flying disc when they had a weather balloon. Who made that mistake? I mean, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, oops. exactly. Oh, actually, it's it's either a flying disc or it's a mylar balloon. One of two. Okay, it can't be both. Okay, it's either this big balloon or it's an actual physical craft. It's physical craft. You don't put that out unless you really got it. And so to us back in the 70s, this was common knowledge. As I said, when I started in 74, my interest was in physiotypes and recoveries. And recoveries were well known at the time. All the Aztec and I'm very glad to hear this. It's it's a good uh kind of revision 
uh, of our of our history of what we thought we knew. And I include myself here because uh, well, there's been you know, there had been rumors. Surprise. I knew there were rumors, but I didn't know that it was as solidly believed by people, at least in your region. Maybe maybe it was your region. I I don't think it was just our region. I really no. don't. I I believe that since that time, it's been suppressed. Mm -hmm. It's been around because it's really easy to do. How many? We, there were uh, monthly, there were a couple of UFO magazines that went out routinely back in the 70s. How many people have copies of those today? You have some of the APRO uh, newsletters, but there were mag full-fledged magazines came out every month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of UFOs. I, I got a nice little collection, but it's not complete. There, yeah. I mean, I have a good one, and I know there's most how many of stuff I don't even, have. It. How many people even know that exists? Like this, this uh, documentary, UFOs Are Real, yeah, people don't even never even heard of that movie, but that was big in the seventies. Uh, so this stuff has been suppressed. They want you to forget this. I, Everything I started in two thousand and four. They don't want you to go back because it's obvious what yeah. happened. It's obvious. Lou has come out and said, and so is Valet. They have these crafts. So what? We knew that back in the seventies. Okay, so. It, they just don't want you to go go there because then you have a preponderance it's like a civil case you have a preponderance of the evidence yeah not all these documents can be false not all these witnesses can be liars not all these federal military people can all be imagining these things they didn't all hallucinate the same thing so it, it just it hopefully we'll see Maybe they can't backpedal. Maybe it's gone too far. Maybe there'll be enough of a press that they just can't deny it anymore. Maybe there'll be more Bob Lazars. Uh, David Adair, I, I really wish he would, he's talked more, but I really wish <laughs> he would come out and talk, talk about- You know, in our last, I'm just gonna say this before we wrap it up. In our, in our other interview where we talked a bit about Adair, there's some comments below. If you haven't seen them, you should check no, it out. No. Uh, yeah, a lot of people were very uh, not believing of he, uh, the idea. He is he is much easier. You can go back and and into the congressional record and document. And I sent you some documents uh, of uh, uh, Lemay's uh, uh, granddaughter who tested. Oh yeah, he knew my my uh, grandfather. So I sent you a, a link to that to her statements and stuff. That no, no, I, 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 I go, I, I haven't, uh, I don't know what I think about David Adair. I honestly, I, it's a cop out. Some people are like, Dolan, what's wrong with you? He's a total fake. Others don't feel that way. And, and uh, I've met the man. Uh, I, as I said, I like him personally. I spilled a big full glass of red wine yeah. on, his, on him one time, but he was very gracious and a, and a brilliant, he's absolutely brilliant. There's and no, his mind is, he's yeah, a his brilliant pass. man. Yeah, his patents can all be researched. His work or He's with brilliant uh, for real, yeah, high level. With General LeMay, it's documented in the congressional record. It's not something he imagined. He was a 17 year old prodigy. I, I said to him, I was like, look, man, you're either the real deal or the big, the best BS artist I've ever met. I, I did said see, this to him so I can say it here. So I did I see really some comment. Know. I don't know if it was on your, your channel or Roy's. Well, about him sleeping in Armstrong's bed. Oh, he must have. Yeah, he talked about this. But he was yeah. just, he was a kid when that happened. When he, when Armstrong walked on the moon, he was still in his, in his uh, Young. teens. Yeah. Yeah. So he wasn't a full grown man at that right, time. Right. Uh, uh, but, uh, um, but no, I, it's his purse. It's his persona. You, you, you look at him. It's just because he, it's just his persona and you got to get through that persona. It's like Bob Lazar. People look at him and say, oh, he's weird. Have you met any physicists? I mean, he's no, Bob is exactly like every physicist I've ever met. He, you know, skinny guy with the, the, the pocket protector and all the pens and pencils in it. Yeah, no, it's, and, it's and yeah, he's exactly that. And when you get them alone, they're normal and they have some, they may have some, they're like anybody they have. Their well, own I, I, I'm a, I've never really been a, a doubter of Lazar. I actually support Lazar. I caught a lot of crap for that uh, years ago when I wrote about him for the first time in one of my books, but uh, I stand by it and I still believe Lazar. Adair, I've always had a, more of a hesitancy, but I will just say this, and this will be my last thing. When you meet him, you cannot not like him. Yeah. yeah uh, you, you cannot dislike 
David Adair. I will just say that to anyone, even even the haters. Uh, he is a, a very genial, personable, and uh, he, I mean, he's a guy I that think, you, he's 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 enjoyable to be around. That's I that's think a it. lot of I think a lot of the people online, not your viewers, but a lot of the crap that comes up about Adair online are from the same people that come up from Bob or the same people that try and obfuscate this stuff. Because if you go to the dare and say, okay, sit down, show me what you've got. Why aren't they bringing Lazar in front of Congress? Why aren't they bringing a dare in front of Congress? Why aren't they bringing ballet in front of Congress? I mean, these, these are people that said, yeah, I was, I saw it. I touched it. It was there. Why don't well, they do that? Because what, what would they have to lose? It would blow the whole thing up. All right, well, we're, we'll have to come back to Adair and the other people another time. I don't know, what to do, but I'm glad we talked about the late 70s. This was a really, uh, I think it was a worthwhile conversation and a unique conversation. I don't think this has ever been discussed before. So no, I'm no, glad you provided, the, uh, you provided some very uh, excellent visuals, which uh, I, I think people enjoyed seeing. And I think this was good. So I want to come back and do this with you again, uh, Alan. I think there's more uh, cool things to talk about. Um, I'd like to talk to you, as I yeah. shared earlier, about you know what I learned in all these interviews because there's a lot uh, of the interviews that you did of uh, UFO of witnesses and like witnesses and stuff, and the conclusions I made. Just like you made, you rewrote your conclusion in in your uh, your book there. Um, did you just? Oh. Yeah, I'll tell people I just I've done a revision and ex much expanded edition of ufos for the 21st century mind and uh, i wrote about 60 new pages for that book 60 is a lot uh and so that's where we were going to try to get it out before christmas cutting a little close yeah. but maybe we will <laughs> we just got the new cover it's beautiful uh i may try to upload it within the next day or two it's possible but yes i wrote i added a, a new conclusion which i shared with members of uh, my website which you got to see yeah, because as time goes on, you you learn things. There are so many things that you would think that, well, why didn't you think about this at the time? Yeah. Well, I didn't have all the information that I have today. And now reflecting, I go like, oh, what about this? What about that? Uh, uh, there's you things know, we're always so, thinking new. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's things that I, I, I won't get into this now, but like everyone's at Saj, oh, the, the Tic Tac knew their cap point. Oh, I can explain that. I mean, that, that I, I wouldn't have been able to explain it 10 years ago, but I can explain that now. And we'll leave it as a not, teaser for our next, our yeah, next one. Yeah, exactly. Well, so, but, people but wanting yeah, more. yeah I, I definitely would like to share what I learned in these, these interviews. Let's do it. You know, we will. Uh, we will definitely. So this well, is thank a, two hour, a two hour thing. And, uh, and I want to wrap this up because uh, I have to been two hours. get this ready <laughs> for the world here. Uh, but I'm I'm very 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 grateful for this, and as always, I've enjoyed uh, our time hanging out here. Um, what one of the listener viewers of comments said, Dolan, stop interrupting Alan all the time. You're always interrupting, <laughs> and and I I don't want to interrupt you, but it's interesting working with you. I just got to say because you are, you're such a wealth of information and your mind, like I can just see like you always you're going in all these places. And here's here's me. I'm sitting here and I'm like, all right, I want us to get to this museum thing. I want to get to the train. And and so I'm always I feel like I'm trying to reel you in. But like you're well, yeah, just you're, like this, you're a good moderator. You're a good moderator. You're this and, and wild you stallion you like in the movie. Yeah. Like wild stallion. That's you. So yeah. um, but I've also felt like you just have so much. Uh, I mean, it's important information. It's fascinating. And it's it's just it needs to be heard. So. But on the other hand, well, it's been dec it's been decades. Two hours is I, enough. I've, yeah, and I've never, I've only shared this with a handful of people, you know, in, in in the thing. So you're you're hearing stuff for from decades. This is all the first time, yeah. No, so we want to do. I want to do another one with you. Definitely, we will absolutely do that. But for now, we're going to cut this at two hours. I, I think two hours is good. I feel like yes, we we've, we've done what we want to do. Um, Wishing so will, you a Merry Christmas and every everybody in the audience Merry Christmas as well. And yes, absolutely. Christmas. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever. I don't know what people do. Whatever you do, I wish you a good one. And uh, and uh, oh, Tracy asked me to make, wish everyone a good one too. She is here. Uh, she's upstairs. But anyway, I uh, 
I want to thank everyone for being here. And uh, again, if you like what I do on this channel, hit the subscribe. If you're not a subscriber, you know how it helps everyone out. Uh, this is what all the YouTuber people say. Subscribe, notifications, and, and so forth. And then go to my site at richardolanmembers.com. And um, you can see a lot more of what I do there. So that is that. I want to thank everyone for being here. And we'll catch you all again really, really soon. Let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.